Okay guys, this is Corey with Seaboard Marine and today we're going to talk about one of the workhorses of the Cummins Marine Diesel mid-range mechanical engine lineup and that's the 6 CTA 8.3 450 Diamond. So stay tuned. Okay, this is the uh, Cummins Marine 6 CTA 8.3 liter uh, what the Cummins calls the 450 Diamond. What's interesting about this engine is uh, the Cummins Marine marketing group was very clever in that uh, the marketing terminology for this engine has always been the 450 Diamond. Interesting thing is, is that this engine is actually 430 SAE brake horsepower, not 450 brake horsepower, all right? The 450 designation uh, is metric horsepower. So unless you're gonna showboat in front of your friends in Europe, uh, this engine is actually a 430 diamond or 430 brake horsepower at 2600 RPM. Okay, we'll go ahead and start on the port side of the engine and start calling out some components and just going through generally what, how the engine is put together. Uh, we'll start at the seawater pump here. The seawater pump is a Sherwood uh, P1730. This pump has been around for a very long time. It has a very colorful history, which is why we offer our own version of the 1730 pump. Uh, you got your raw water inlet here, and which is a two inch inlet, and then we have an inch and three quarter outlet at the top of the pump that ultimately leads down to the entry of the after cooler. Both of these uh, hose sizes are inch and three quarter. You notice this particular engine is missing What's normally here is the, the fuel cooler. Okay, and the fuel cooler is actually inch and seven eighths on both ends. So you'll have a reducing hose here from inch and seven eighths to inch and three quarter. Same for the entry of the after cooler. You'll have inch and three quarter here, inch and seven eighths on the fuel cooler. Okay, in this particular case, we're actually gonna remove the fuel cooler since it's not required. And we're going to uh, install a piece of inch and three quarter wire hose that connects the, the outlet of the seawater pump to the entry of the after cooler. Okay, moving on. Uh, this engine is equipped with the uh, Bosch P7100. Uh, very common, uh, tried and tested fuel injection pump. Um, this pump is equipped with a fuel lift pump. This is how in most cases you'll prime the fuel if you don't have anything external to prime it. There's a plunger on this pump that you can pump and once fuel is primed you would expect this plunger to start getting difficult to press and it actually has a little squeak in it. Once you hear the squeak you'll know the fuel is primed. On the left side of the lift pump you have the fuel inlet here. Okay this is where fuel supply is going to come into the engine. Okay you'll see it comes in here goes through the pump travels over to the on engine fuel filter here, okay, and then back into the fuel inlet of the injection pump here. On the other side of the fuel side, we have the return circuit. And the return circuit is actually on the back of the injection pump and comes down here. Now this blue hose is what was uh, previously used with the fuel cooler, okay, which has a connection point here. In many cases, you can remove this hose and connect direct to the return, which is a flat face fitting, right here at the base of the fuel pump. Okay, moving forward. Uh, here we have the what's called the fuel shutoff solenoid. This shutoff solenoid is how you uh, are allowed to both run and stop the engine. The solenoid basically manipulates the fuel lever. This fuel lever is what meters fuel into the engine. When this is closed, no fuel gets into the engine and the engine will not run. When you crank the engine, this solenoid is designed to suck all the way up, pull the fuel lever all the way up and allow fuel into the engine. Okay, and once you're done cranking, uh, see this is a three wire solenoid. Once the cranking period is over, the ignition power, let's say the cranking period uh, will pull about 10 amps into this solenoid and suck it up. Once cranking's done and the engine has started, then the ignition power, which is about one amp, uh, is required to hold this solenoid in the up position allowing fuel into the engine. When power is removed from the solenoid, the solenoid drops and fuel is cut off, the engine should shut down. All right, okay, uh, here's our, our fuel uh, throttle lever, okay, simple. Our connection points here, you're going to run a manual cable uh, clamped here and here with the ball joint and this is how we 
is how we manage fuel to the engine. Okay? This big component here is our after cooler. This is what cools the air that's being compressed from the turbo through the tube and exchanges heat between uh, the hot compressed air on the intake side uh, against raw water coming through the internal bundle. Okay, so as air enters, it can be upwards of three, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time it passes through and enters into the engine, it's somewhere between uh, coolant temperature, which would be around 160, 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Behind the after cooler unit, you can notice here, this is where Cummins mounted the transmission oil cooler. There's uh, two ports on the cooler. Those are both half inch pipe ports and you'll run two lines to the transmission for in and out uh, that exchanges heat between the transmission oil and the raw water, be it fresh water or salt water. Okay. Motor versus. Yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. If we look at this particular after cooler, you'll notice it, it has a different appearance from the standard after cooler that was used pre-2021. This is a Moda after cooler. This is made in, uh, by the Moda company in France. It has a different shape to it and does require different O-rings, different internal core, different caps, different everything. So this is what a Moda looks like. If yours does not look like this, then you have a standard after cooler, again, which requires a different bundle, different O-rings, different caps. It yeah, but it's backwards compatible. It does the same thing. Okay, moving forward, uh, we'll notice here this is our um, this is the connection point for our on on engine wiring. There's an eight pin molded connector here, and there's two additional wires. A lot of guys will ask us what these additional wires are for, uh, and the answer to that is nothing. Okay, these wires don't actually do anything. One of them was provisioned for an energized to stop function, which is the opposite of how this engine works. And the other one was, was potentially used for a, a water and fuel circuit. These, these wires are available, so if you can find the other end of them and you need to use them, they are usable. The other wires um, are all contained here. And again, it's a standard eight pin connection. This is what runs up to the dash, uh, to the instrument panel and the key switch or push button to start and stop the engine. Uh, this connector here you'll notice has a yellow and red wire on it. This is a loop over uh, jumper for the crank signal. Okay, so if you, if you have a neutral safety circuit or a start interlock circuit and you want to, let's say you have a switch on your transmission and you only want to start the engine if it's in neutral, you can run these wires to that switch. And if the switch is in neutral and closed, it will allow you to start the engine. Okay, so following the raw water circuit, if we look down here, raw water circuit starts as follows. It starts uh, from the strainer of the hull of the boat into the seawater pump, out of the seawater pump, into the base of the after cooler, travels up the after cooler through the internal bundle, exchanging heat, okay, and then out of the cap on, on top, into the transmission oil cooler, and then out of the transmission oil cooler and wraps around the engine. Okay, then you notice it comes directly into the heat exchanger. All right, this is how we exchange heat between the raw water and the engine coolant. This is like the engine's radiator without uh, using air. We're using raw water to cool the engine. Once the, water the raw water comes out of the heat exchanger, it exits the exhaust side, and this would be going into a wet exhaust system and out of the boat. Okay, now we're on the starboard side of the engine. Uh, the components are pretty straightforward. Here's our starter. Okay, we got our positive lug and our negative lug. Okay, we look here. This is our what we call our auxiliary or magnetic switch uh, or start solenoid. There's a lot of terminology used for this. Uh, basically, this serves two functions. When you crank the engine, this terminal here is the red wire is always positive, always hot, and on this particular terminal. Uh, we have two connections. One is the white wire. This white wire is what sucks up the fuel shutoff solenoid, allowing the engine to run. This yellow wire sends power to the starter when the coil is energized from the key or push button, sending power to the S terminal of the starter. So once you turn the key or push the button at the helm, power is relayed to the mag switch and to the S terminal of the starter, engaging the starter motor and cranking the engine over. Now, again, like we said before, once the engine fires up, this white wire here no longer has power and the fuel shutoff solenoid is held up 
by the ignition power and no longer by this magnetic switch. Okay, moving on, we have uh, the on-engine oil filter. This is an LF9009, it's a very large filter. Okay, adjacent to that on the same head is the engine oil cooler. This engine oil cooler box unit here is what uh, exchanges heat between the coolant and the engine oil, keeping the engine oil cool. Okay, uh, this filter here, a lot of guys ask what this filter is for. This is actually a coolant filter or what's called a water filter. Uh, this is a WF fleet guard filter. And again, it has a chemical inside of it called DCA, which is a coolant additive, a non-corrosive additive that keeps the coolant um, good for a long period of time. Okay, moving on from the starter positive here, you'll notice a red cable that goes directly to the alternator. This engine is uh, originally equipped with a 22 SI 12 volt 130 amp alternator. Okay, and this alternator is a three wire alternator, and we can tell that because there's a red wire coming out of the base of this alternator. This is called a sensing lead, and this sensing lead. Um, is actually traveling through the harness. You can see the wire here and sensing uh, battery voltage. And this alternator is required to see battery voltage in order for the internal regulator to sense uh, how much charge and when it needs to charge. Okay, if you notice back behind the alternator, this engine is equipped with a coolant level, or excuse me, a coolant temperature sending unit it's in kind of a tight spot, but that's where the sending unit is located. And then next, when we go back to the other side of the engine, we'll show you where the oil sensor is located. Uh, this is the heat exchanger coolant section. This goes down here, and you'll notice at the base of this, there'll be two thermostats, okay? There'll be 260 degree thermostats for the 6C engine, okay? The front uh, tank is the coolant expansion tank. And you'll notice in this configuration, there's three lines. These are called coolant vent lines, and they vent the coolant to various locations of the engine. One would be the turbo. What, another one would be the exhaust manifold. This exhaust manifold is coolant cooled. There's a, there's a coolant vent line to that. There's also a coolant vent line back to the block as well. Now, if we look to the front of the engine, the components are pretty straightforward. Here's our alternator again. Then we have our belt tensioner, which keeps the belt tensioned. This is our coolant pump, our idler pulley, and this is the front engine damper, okay? This particular engine uses an eight groove serpentine belt. Uh, this is what we consider a blue belt. Okay, now we're back on the port side of the engine. We'll cover a few more items. One of, those of which is if you wonder where the oil pressure sending unit is located. It is located on the block. If you notice, there's a bunch of plugs. These are actually plugs that give you access to the oil, engine oil gallery or live oil pressure. This particular sender has an eighth inch pipe thread and is threaded directly into the block. Uh, this blue line coming out of the oil pan is your oil drain plug, or your oil drain line, excuse me, that's actually capped on the end here. This is how you introduce oil and remove oil from the oil pan. Okay, moving on, we have tucked behind here, this particular module, you'll notice there's two relays, okay? And these lines will attach all the way up to the, the intake manifold. There's what's called a heater grid here. And this is a heating element that goes between um, the air inlet and the intake manifold. The purpose of this device is to preheat the air going into the engine. Now, for about the last six, seven years, Cummins has not been delivering this unit with the ECU or the computer unit that's meant to control that. So out of the box, it's not going to work uh, unless you wire it up manually. There's a lot of different components. If you notice this piece here that going into the intake, that's a thermosistor. And that would normally tell the brain the air temperature going into the engine. Uh, and the other input here is the magnetic pickup. This magnetic pickup is a dual output magnetic pickup, meaning there's two outputs, one of which will deliver a tack signal to the instrument cluster. The other uh, delivers a tack signal to 
uh, the ECU unit of the preheater. In this case, it's not provided, so it's not gonna work. The only way to make the air heater work in this particular circumstance would be to operate it manually. Okay, uh, back on the port side. Um, these are your hard fuel injection lines that uh, deliver fuel to the injectors. There's six lines here and they're distributed evenly to each one of the six injectors. If you notice this piece on the back side, every injector has an outlet for the return, okay? So this particular manifold runs all the way across connecting to each one of the injectors and delivers fuel back to the return circuit of the injection pump. On the top of the engine, this is our valve cover. As opposed to the B-Series engine, this is a single valve cover. Here's your oil fill, very simple. And on the top of this, we have our crankcase ventilation uh, setup. In this particular circumstance, it's very simple. The crankcase is vented from the top of the valve cover, coming out through a tube and out through a plastic tube, basically out to the atmosphere or in the engine room. We don't particularly favor this setup, especially if you have a high blow-by condition because you're gonna spew a lot of uh, oil and, and vapors and stuff into your engine room. Uh, we do make a crankcase ventilation kit for this engine that is a closed circuit that is much more preferred. Let a lot of that stuff uh, get recirculated back into the engine. Uh, okay, going back over to the turbocharger. Uh, we have a hard flexible line that provides oil to the spindle between the two cartridges of the turbocharger. So here there's an oil feed into the spindle which lubricates the bearings. And then below the turbo, you'll notice there is a turbo oil drain. Now this drain has a hose coupling connection here and this drain, you can follow the tube, will go all the way back into the block of the engine. Another component here uh, that can fail at time to time is an ignition uh, fuse circuit. It's a 10 amp circuit here and a lot of times if uh, you get a lot of rust or corrosion on these particular terminals you can end up with a lot of intermittent issues and sometimes issues that would cause an absolute uh, engine not to run or start because of these connections. So if you're dealing with an issue like that it's always a good idea to look at the on engine fuse as, as a culprit first to make sure these connections are nice clean and tight and solid. Okay. Now, this engine comes from the factory with a standard SAE 3 bell housing connection and a standard SAE 11.5 inch flywheel. This flywheel has 127 teeth. And again, the magnetic pickup unit here is, is installed very close to the ring gear of the flywheel, which has those 127 teeth. As the flywheel spins, the magnetic pickup is sending those pulses of the teeth up to the tachometer and also to the preheater uh, circuit. Okay, and that, uh, that kind of wraps up everything about the uh, modern day M3 6CTA 8.3.